It is absolutely disgusting what they do, and I think that it's only going to get worse because Bitcoin is a threat to them. Most of what we see that gets labeled as quote-unquote capitalism is really corporatism and is just as evil as socialism or anything else. The solution is sound money. It doesn't matter if that's Bitcoin or not. The fact that Congress passed a bill that would effectively ban the use of a website is incredibly authoritarian. Uh, you wrote a book, uh, The Liberty Solution. Uh, first of all, like, let's get a little bit into your book. Uh, what's what's the core message of the book? Like, what's the the, the core principles uh, that you can uh, give us from from the the book? What inspired you to write it? And then, like, uh, when we get into this, then we later can get a little bit also in Bitcoin. No, yeah, so. Um... At its core, the the book is mainly a, a philosophical treatise on liberty and natural law. Um, you know, it, we we as a as a as a people, um, it, particularly in, in the U.S., we have this uh, misguided understanding of what liberty actually is. Um, you know, we seem to misunderstand that. Uh, Liberty means that people will act in a way that you don't like. As long as they're not hurting anybody, um, there is, you know, they have the right to do those sorts of things. And in modern political American discourse, um, and I'm sure it's it's like this all across the globe uh, to, to a rather large degree, but um, we seem to think that liberty means that which I like and agree with. And that's not the case. Um, you know, you'll get your typical conservatives talking about, um, you know, let's let's ban uh, burning the American flag or let's ban this or ban that. And then you got people on the left, the, the lefties that are all, uh, yeah, let's ban guns. Let's, um, you know, let's make sure that we use the state to uphold this doctrine that we agree with. That's not what liberty is. Liberty is... Uh, taking sole dominion over your own life and not infringing upon those on the right of another person to do the same. So just because somebody is acting in a way that you find morally reprehensible, um, outright, you know, deplorable, uh, as long as they're not bringing harm to another person, direct harm, then they have the right to do that. So, you know, if somebody wants to uh, a, a simple uh, simple example that I give is if somebody wants to, you know, drink to excess on a very daily basis and just get sloppy drunk, um, that's their right to do it. And some people might argue, well, he's harming himself. Well, he owns himself and he has the right to engage in those harmful behaviors. Uh, you could extend this a step further to things like drug prohibition or drug, you know, substance control and scheduling by the state. It all is the, exactly the same thing fundamentally. So just because somebody is in using a substance that you don't like, they have the right to do that because of the fact that they own themselves. And I expand upon this uh, in part one of the book, highlighting different areas in which the U.S. government infringes upon the rights of individuals, um, whether that be TSA screenings, uh, gun background checks, uh, taxation, uh, you name it. And then in part two, I apply those principles into what I consider real world applications. So uh, what would it look like if we took liberty to its its logical conclusions? And I argue that that would be reminiscent of what is called anarcho-capitalism. And for those who aren't, uh, you know, privy on the philosophy, basically, it means no government exists, no centralized authority, no monopoly on violence to coerce people into uh, into compliance. But it also means self ownership. It means taking responsibility for yourself and for your, for your for your loved ones. And I also make it very clear as to what capitalism is, because there's a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stigma around what capitalism is. And most of what we see uh, that gets labeled as quote unquote capitalism is really corporatism and uh, is just as evil as, you know, socialism or anything else. 
Uh, so capitalism is nothing more than the free and voluntary exchange of a private property within a free market. And anything that's beyond that scope doesn't fit the criteria. So what anarcho-capitalism really means is, you know, you taking sole dominion over your life, you're responsible for your life and, and everything about your life, and you have the freedom to exchange your property. That's all that it means. And I also dig a little bit deeper as to what anarchy means and how it is also stigmatized and misrepresented as being some sort of Mad Max style, you know, apocalyptic world where, uh, you know, warmongers have taken over uh, and how there's, you know, slavery everywhere. And my my thought on that is that that is actually what we have right now with statism and any sort of centralized government. So that's kind of ultimately what the book is about. And I think uh, in particular what, um, you know, what, what your listeners might be interested in is how money changes without a centralized monopoly on violence like the government. Uh, how do we engage in that sort of transaction if we don't have the U.S. Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury you know, printing these wonderful Federal Reserve notes that we have and, you know, you know the or the euro in, in, in Europe. Uh, how do we negotiate that medium of, of exchange? And it's it is um, it is something that I explore a bit. Uh, and honestly, it would ultimately yield a a much more satisfactory quality of life for everybody. One hundred percent agree then with, with, with that and. Um, I, all, I often talk about Bitcoin in the podcast. I mean, almost every podcast episode is, is almost primarily about Bitcoin. There are a few exceptions to that. Uh, and I had a few podcast episodes back to discussing about what is freedom, actually. Like, what does it mean? What does freedom mean? Uh, and for me, and, and you touched on it, uh, I mean, conceptually, for me, is freedom uh, uh, goes as far as the freedom from someone else has started. So as a small example for that, if I don't use my seatbelt in my car, it's totally up to me. Like nobody, no third party should be able to tell me uh, to click my uh, seatbelt because it's my body. I can do whatever I want to, to do with it. And I, if I choose to do the seatbelt, I choose to do it. If I'm not, then I don't. But I cannot drive with uh, 200 kilometers per hour through a street where there are kids playing or something like that. This This would be... Uh, something irresponsible because uh, I could damage someone else's life, uh, and there where it makes it might make sense to have like guidance uh, or, or uh, at least like signs that like okay drive here slower because your freedom uh, expands over to someone else's freedoms. Is that what you described? Like uh, the freedom goes as far as someone else's freedom starts, or is that something different? No, I I would. I would echo uh, most of what you said. Where I would disagree is that while it is certainly a bad idea to drive 200 kilometers per hour past a, a neighborhood park where children are playing, as long as nobody gets injured as a result of that, you do technically have the right to do that. Now, we could get into the nuances of uh, you know who owns the street that you're driving on because at the end of the day there is you know in my ideal world there's no such thing as quote unquote public property there's either uh nature's property which hasn't been claimed which has you know is just as virgin as the day that the earth was born uh and then there is private property so private property is anything that has had labor introduced to it to transform it from the way that nature left it to us so in my ideal world, somebody would own those streets and they would have the right to dictate, you know, your speed limits as terms of use, which you would voluntarily agree to as a condition for utilizing that road. Um, but ultimately, uh, as long as nobody is injured, uh, then you do have the right to do it. Is it dangerous? Yes. Should it be frowned upon? Absolutely. Should it be ostracized even? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, but as long as nobody is harmed, you do have the right to do that. And going back to the private owner and operator of that street, uh, by violating their terms of use, you are, in effect, uh, 
trespassing. So you would be, there is an argument to be made that if anybody is harmed in this scenario, it's the owner of the street and not the, the children that are playing because they actually didn't have any direct harm. Now, if you hit one of those children, that's a completely different story. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, when everybody respects the private property and everybody is like, okay, this is a street where I only can drive this limit. Uh, it's owned by this individual. Uh, and he says, okay, this is an area where kids should play and I should not drive as fast. Uh, but what if there is like in that world, is there any centralized authority on, 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 um, uh, uh, a monopoly on uh, violence, as you said. Uh, is is there anything, s stuff like that? Because when there's a conflict coming up, how do we manage that? Like, how, how do we come up with solutions for conflicts in, if they're like, okay, but maybe this, like, I, I hear it so many times of like neighborhoods, like the, the one neighbor is like, no, that, that's my side or this, like, there's so many weird reasons to go to court. Um, is there in such a, Solutions are the private courts. Is that like the private institutional uh, courts? How is this? How is this side of the story working? Yeah, so uh, you you hit it right on, and and this doesn't again. This is all theoretical, um, and so any solution that I present either here or in my book is just an idea. There are actually infinite number of of ideas that we could come up with that um, could serve as a as a potential solution to all this. What I have kind of lay, laid out a little bit in the book is is private arbitration, uh, private courts. And, and we even have this to a degree um, with alternative dispute um, resolution. So instead of bogging something down in a tort court, um, you know, people get together with a third party mediator or even an arbitrator uh, to look over everything and come to either a compromise or in the case of arbitration, actually make a ruling, even though it's not a... a government judge making that ruling, um, the parties agreed to go to arbitration and uh, agreed to whatever the outcome was. It's a voluntary agreement. And we could ha expand that to essentially be the entire court system where if somebody has uh, a grievance against somebody else, they could petition that court. Um, all the fees would have to be covered uh, by the uh, you know, the parties involved in some way or another by, by agreement. Um, and, uh, you know, they would rule, agree to, to follow the ruling one way or the other before it happens. Um, you know, in the cases of like this, it would be pretty straightforward and simple. Okay. Uh, he set this limit, you exceeded that limit willingly and, and at a, you know, double, triple, whatever the, the speed limit was, um, you know, this is pretty objective here. You violated his terms of service, and therefore we're going to enforce what penalties he lays out for violating those terms of service. Now, there is no monopoly on violence to make sure that this happens. And so let's say I took you to court for speeding on my streets. I wouldn't have, like, cops come to your house and invoke violence on you if you didn't pay me what was just deemed to be paid from that court ruling. But what I could do is I could publicly ostracize you and say, hey, look, this person went to court with me. Uh, it was ruled in my favor and he owes me this amount of money uh, per that ruling. And he has not paid me. Now, your reputation in this world has actual value. And what I'm doing is I am publicly depreciating your reputation as somebody who can't be trusted, which means that all the other relationships that you would voluntarily have are now kind of questioning what type of person that you are. Uh, and so some of them might want to end your, their relationship with you or at least keep you at a different distance. So this could impact your bu future business dealings. This could impact any future relationships that you have, public uh, or um, professional, personal, whatever. Um you know, if it's bad enough, like in the cases of, of murder, rape, like legitimate evil acts being committed, not just a, oh, I disagree, uh, but legitimate evil acts, your landlord could kick you out of the out of your house. Uh, your bank could close all your accounts and just send you all your money and say, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. Your employer could instantly terminate you. Your life would be destroyed without having this centralized monopoly on violence because of 
public ostracism based off of what you actually did. I love that idea. I mean, uh, I always uh, argue for more freedom. I all, I'm always, uh, whenever I'm in a group of people, I'm always the one arguing for more freedom and, and less state interference. Uh, a lot of the arguments that I hear against it is like, how do we protect uh, the ones that are coming? I mean, this is a minority. We have to always capture, like, we should not make rules for, uh, uh, like, not get in a direction where we only make rules for a minority and put it on a whole a whole, a whole pack, uh, if, if you know what I mean. Um, but what if, like, in that kind of a world, uh, for people that come with disabilities on the world where they just cannot um, have so much value for society as somebody, somebody else, and this is, like, as I said, small amount of people, the most... Most are just lazy, as, as I see it, uh, and they should be more incentivized by a more incentivizing system. But what, what do we do with, with those kind of people? Is, is there like just private institutions that would naturally care for them because they are good human beings? Yeah. And I would also argue that human beings are naturally like a bit on the uh, altruist side. We do care for our fellow human. Um, what has kind of desensitized that has been the government's involvement uh, with literally everything where, oh, don't worry about it. The government will take care of it. If there was no government to take care of it, then I firmly believe that we as humans would identify people who are going through very hard times, either by or through no fault of their own, uh, or maybe they made bad decisions and they're trying to learn from them. People genuinely are very charitable for the most part, uh, even despite the fact that uh, the government has stolen more and more of our property, you know, as the years have gone on. Uh, I forget the actual numbers, but I broke it down in, in a later chapter in my book. Uh, despite the fact that tax revenues, quote unquote, or theft has gone up significantly, even adjusted for the devaluation of the dollar. Charitable donations have also skyrocketed. And if we stopped the theft from the government to begin with, then I think that people would be even more charitable than they already are and already have proven themselves to be. And uh, unlike, um, you know, the the government controlled charities, you know, and you have to do these sorts of things to maintain your nonprofit status and blah, blah, blah. Uh, those regulations wouldn't exist. And so they would actually have the ability to focus on uh, really helping other people. And they'd have a fiduciary duty to helping those people. Uh, and then once they ha are back on their feet, um, you know, they're better off for it instead of, you know, getting some government handout, which essentially perpetuates the issue um, and, uh, you know, doesn't actually resolve anything. I, I think that private charities would be a, a great mechanism, especially in an anarchist type world without government control and regulation to make sure that they're hitting these, 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 and this, you know, uh, regulatory burdens just to be a charitable organization. I always argue that Bitcoin is non-political, um, even though I see a lot of arguments against that actually, uh, because Bitcoin incentivizes some behaviors. For example, Bitcoin incentivizes low time preference against high time preference. Uh, Bitcoin incentivizes like to keep your money and not spend it on dumb shit you don't need. Uh, Bitcoin also incentivizes as uh, I think uh, freedom to a certain extent because it's for me and I want to get into it if you see it the, the same way. For me, it's the only real property we can actually hold because it's the only property even if someone is putting a gun to your head, you can still choose <laughs> to keep it. Um, if a house, someone can shoot you and then you can just take the house, like because it's physical. Yeah. The, uh, Bitcoin you can keep in your head and they can shoot you, but maybe they, they shoot away your Bitcoin also. Um, what I want to go with, like, is is that kind of a, um, idea what you describe in the book and what you, we described now in the first 20 minutes of the podcast, is Bitcoin as... Is Bitcoin bringing us a little bit closer to that future? Absolutely. Um, you know, Bitcoin will always be the the OG of cryptos, right? I mean, it was the first one. Um, you know, it, 
it revolutionized what money potential could be. And I think, uh, you know, you've seen since the inception of Bitcoin, all of these other cryptos come out, uh, some having real utility, others not so much like Dogecoin. You know, it's just based off of hype. OK, but most people don't realize that a lot of the crypto projects that we see, the altcoin projects are actually based off of, you know, rather real utility. Um, and much like investing in a company stock, um, you know, there is some inherent value uh, tied to that crypto asset um, that that can help revolutionize the, the crypto industry even more. And ultimately what cryptocurrency is, is it is com competition in uh, being born into the medium of exchange market, which governments have always had a monopoly on. And that's what makes it so revolutionary is that before governments controlled what money was, they defined what money was, whether that was the Roman Empire, um, you know, taking what the what their Roman coins were, uh, the purity of them as far as, you know, silver and gold content would be. And then saying, oh, yeah, we're going to decree that we're going to clip this a little bit uh, for, you know, for justifiable reasons, I assure you. Uh, and so it ultimately they ended up clipping out all of the all of the actual intrinsic value of it and making it nothing more than a, a 10 coin that doesn't have any value whatsoever, which is what ultimately caused the Roman Empire to fall. And we see that we saw that in in ancient Rome. We see that now with, you know, the Federal Reserve, the World Bank, uh, all of these centralized banks uh, essentially having a complete fiat currency, uh, you know, and, and what's even kind of crazier is these modern monetary theorists coming out like this is what the future of money is. No, this is not what the future of money is. This is this is legitimately the track record of fiat money has been and it's been abysmal. But because cryptocurrency has been able to become an actual competitor into an otherwise monopolistic environment. That means that people start looking at their government currency with a little bit less sparkle in their eyes. And I think that as time goes on, and you've already seen it from 2009 to now in 2024, people have started to understand the value that Bitcoin has and the value that, that other cryptocurrencies have. I mean... Uh, uh, Bitcoin is uh, is back over sixty thousand right now, and yet we still celebrate Bitcoin Pizza Day, where somebody spent ten thousand Bitcoin on two pizzas. Ten thousand Bitcoin. You know, you you take all of this and you you give it to the average person and say, "This is what real money can do." Then they start to wonder about those little Federal Reserve notes in their wallet and the 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 balance that shows on their bank account. And that's the beauty of capitalism generally, but I think that it's really indicative of how powerful an entity is that has control over the money. Yeah, I'd say I totally agree with that. Like, I mean, uh, the only part that, uh, like, I I don't see a lot of value in the altcoin market right now. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong, and I like I like as I came into the crypto market like four or five years ago. Uh, then I was like, Bitcoin had a lot of other altcoins in my portfolio. Then I went Bitcoin only. Then I went really toxic against uh, all the altcoins. Uh, now I'm more like a free market proponent. Where I'm like, okay, I have only Bitcoin, uh, but everything else like is also fair game. Uh, if if they will have long term real utility and value in the market, they will sustain. Uh, let's see where it goes. If if they don't, they don't. Uh, it's like the, the free market. I, I also don't get why uh, an art like uh, Mona Lisa or something like that, uh, which has obviously a lot of value for, for people, I would never pay anything for, for that uh, ending because it has no value for me. But that's where the free market comes in, right? You have some people uh, like only this, some people only like this. Uh, let's see what the, what the future holds up. Uh, but the, uh, I don't see the... the I don't see the proof from decentralization uh, on a lot of the other 
um, uh, cryptos and that's why I'm like scared away of them because I see a lot of uh, things, for example, the second was decentralized as, as I see it or the, the most powerful from the altcoins is Ethereum. Uh, and then I'm like, okay, they switch completely their, their proof of work uh, to proof of stake model. They already uh, moved back uh, um, a transaction and I'm like, okay, maybe <laughs> maybe I'm switching the, the central bank for like a private one that's uh, maybe even worse, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I like Bitcoin where like there's nobody manipulating it and Bitcoin has kind of proven that it's actually centralized especially if the block size was, this was a big one for me. And like without the block size was, I think the proof provability of Bitcoin that it's sort of centralized would be different. Uh, but as we come back to free market, like Bitcoin can also fail. And that's what I'm trying to uh, get across my, my, my podcasts more and more where I'm like, okay, yes, I'm all about Bitcoin. I love Bitcoin. I would uh, always support Bitcoin, uh, but I could also be wrong. But what I'm not wrong is about my values, my my uh, thinking of the free market and that we need sound money and the evolution of sound money. And that's why I like the Bitcoin standard, the book from Cyberdeen so much, because it talks about like the, the history of sound money and how uh, how we have like drifted off a little bit with the, <laughs> the, the fiat notes uh, yeah. and how bad it is. And uh, even if Bitcoin fails tomorrow, I will still have the podcast and still will educate for sound money. We probably need a better solution then, uh, but it would be really hard. It would be a devastating day, but I would not stop to educate for some money. Then we just need another form of that, uh, even though I definitely don't believe that Bitcoin will go away anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. And the thing is, like y you said it, the solution is sound money. It doesn't matter if that's Bitcoin or not. Anything that's sound for a monetary medium of exchange will work as long as there's no monopoly over it. That competition is really what um, will help ensure that we don't get into like what we saw with the Roman Empire with cutting of coins uh, and, you know, ultimately ending up on a purely fiat standard. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What did actually initially like? Did you ever always thought like that, or is there was there some event in your life where like I uh, was driven more towards to the, the freedom side of things? Is there something like that formed your, your brain in into this direction? <laughs> that is a simple question with a uh, with a bit of a long winded answer. So I'll try and keep it a little short. But um, you know, I grew up in a typical conservative household. You know, American conservative household, red, white, and blue. You know, uh, love the Fourth of July. You know that that type of uh, that type of family. Uh, we always voted Republican because freedom, yay! Um, and I remember, you know, when I was in high school, I I really idolized the. Um, the nuances of, you know, at least what history was being told to me about America's founding and championing of, of individual liberty and this, that, and the other. So it was always kind of something that resonated with me. Then I joined the military right after high school. And, um, that was the first time I started really questioning some things. Um, but I was still very much a, a Republican, um, you know, very much, a somebody who, loved and supported the Constitution of the United States of America and uh, thought that I was serving my country, but I would, I would see a couple things and it would just trigger something in my brain, like, this doesn't seem right. And um, I got out of the military uh, and then I, I kept watching what current events were, were leading to. And... Uh, it kind of just evolved from there. I became a bit more libertarian as time went on. Um, and, uh, I decided to officially stop calling myself a Republican in 2016 when, uh, when Donald Trump won the, the nomination. I was just like, this is, this is, this is reality TV. There's nothing real here. Um, and 2016 was the first time I voted libertarian. Um, and I kept, I kept that ideal, uh, and I became a gun rights advocate, um, 
I had a podcast for Lone Star Gun Rights, uh, which is a grassroots gun rights organization in the state of Texas. Our main goal at that time was to get permitless carry passed where you could carry a gun on your person without having to beg the state for permission to do so first. And, um, I, uh, I, I remember in, I think it was 2017 ish. Um, there was a, there was a tragedy in, at a high school in Santa Fe, Texas, where somebody had, um, you know, killed a bunch of students and it was really tragic. Um, Following that, uh, there was a gun rights rally uh, that we organized called Carry for Our Kids. Um, and I was a speaker at that event, and I gave my speech on liberty and, you know, rights and all that. And somebody in the audience uh, afterwards came to me and said, hey, I think you should write a book on on this because what you said was really profound and, um, you know, it, it just made a whole lot of sense. And I'd like you know, to, if you could like put this in book form and just expand on it to every direction that you can, I think that would be really awesome. And so the next day I started writing my book, which ultimately became the Liberty Solution. And as I'm writing it, I think when I first started writing it, I called myself, um, more of a minarchist. I would, I, I would, I would often say I'm three degrees separated from a, from an anarchist. And, uh, as I did all the research for my book, uh, I stumbled upon a writer by the name of Murray and Rothbard. And that changed my life because Murray Rothbard articulated things that he t articulated solutions to the very few things that I could not come up with reasons that the government shouldn't exist in those areas. Like, like we talked about courts or police and things like that. Uh, those were the few th areas where I was like, I don't see anything other than the government being able to control these things, you know, fairly, quote unquote. Uh, and then I read Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty, and he laid it all out for me. And I was like, well, that's it. I'm an anarchist now. There's there's no more excuses. Um, you know, I have the solutions, you know, at least ideas for those solutions and how they could work. Uh, and that's kind of my philosophical evolution you know from you know my high school days till now if you are listening to this podcast you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of robin or how can i improve my bitcoin setup and there's two things you have to buy bitcoin from the right source and you have to store bitcoin the right way let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. I love it so much. Uh, I mean, we like there there's always like this this points in the life where like the the life is kind of formed and i love also that you, you wrote a book uh mm -hmm. a, a really selfish question now because i'm also in the um, process of thinking of all the things i've learned in the last like 26 years where i'm on 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 this planet uh, and thinking of like a book and i have a i have like four directions where i want to go with that book um what tips do you have for someone that wants to write his first book uh, and has no clue about writing a book 
or publishing a book uh, do you have any like uh, tips or like anything that you were like oh i wish i've known that before uh anything like that how much time do you have <laughs> <laughs> i will i will tell you this uh probably one of the best things that you can do is create a solid outline before you ever put pen to paper um always remember that you are always your worst critic so after you're done writing something and you go back and read it remember that you're going to be critiquing yourself more than anybody else on the planet will be and so because of that i would always find somebody that you trust to kind of read things but make sure that they understand that you're looking for criticism. You know, you're looking for ways to improve it. Don't just tell me it's good because you're my friend or whatever. Um, somebody that will be honest with you, uh, whether that's, you know, the nuances of a sentence structure or whether the whole idea just seems bogus. That's fine. You can take that feedback. And even if you disagree with the feedback, it might give you even something that you can address in a, in a subsequent set of paragraphs. Like, some might argue this, this, and this, and to that I would say, you know, something like that. Um, and then I would say be patient because I, I, I'm working on my second book now, and um, I have hit the worst writer's block I have ever had. I have not written a word in about three months now. It happens. Be patient with it let it come do not force it because that's just that's just going to it's going to take away from your overall message uh, i know that there are some things that are a bit time sensitive especially if you're writing nonfiction. um you know because something could change in the crypto industry um as you're writing that changes a nuance of a direction that you were going so be patient with it. If you need to, if you need to make those changes, make those changes. Uh, but don't feel like, oh, I have to get this done immediately because, uh, you know, if I don't, then things could change. And then what am I going to do? Well, everything's going to change at some point. So take your time with it step by step. Make sure you have a good outline. Don't be afraid to edit your outline either as you're going. Um, but just something to help keep your 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 focus and and make sure that it's a i'll tell you whenever you're writing things are going to start jumbling up in your head like crazy you're going to be in the middle of a paragraph and like oh crap where do i want to go with this and that's kind of where your outline will help because then you can instead of writing it on your your actual draft you can kind of type out a couple of bullet points and be like okay how do i want to go about this so that's the advice that i would give you uh, it's amazing i i've i've actually uh, started uh, just writing chapters and i think i have now like 30 or something like like i not writing chapters just like the headlines of it uh and the short like five sentence thing where i'm like okay i could write this and i'm like now just in the process of finding ideas and, and finding directions i can go with i did not read any like did not write anything down and the amazing thing is also like just the process of starting okay i want to write a book started something amazing whenever i have a thought I'm like, oh shit, this is something really nice. I'm just writing down in this note and this, like it started with like a half a page. Now it's like all, all, already 10 pages long, this thing. Uh, and it will be, I think it will be more complicated to have like a focus book than like, I will, I think I will not struggle with finding content or like with, with making good content and, and making it. What I also really like is that you said like timely content because I always try also with the podcast, I try to not um, put anything in there that is like current. Like I will, I will never uh, talk with with guests about like, oh, this just happened in Bitcoin. Let's talk about it, because uh, I want this every podcast episode to be um, digestible. Also in there, like a year or two years. Obviously, yeah. some things will change as the Bitcoin price. When we talk about Bitcoin price, we mentioned the Bitcoin price now. I feel like in four years when someone watches this will be like a choke to him that the Bitcoin price <laughs> was at 60,000. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so like I try always to everything I do to be uh, timeless, to be evergreen uh, because this is uh, how I just fun function, except of my Twitter page, but this, this is something 
different. I think a tweet can not live long anyways. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, um, in, in the sense of social media and content, which is also really interesting for, for freedom because it's kind of in this digital revolution that I think brings more freedom to our world because when we look back, uh, we only had this like media companies uh, and only this uh, mm -hmm. like scripted things. And now we have individual creators and a decentralized way of getting information more decentralized. They, they are still living on centralized platforms, but at least there's uh, a person that I can directly follow. Um, do you do you also see this? Like, do you see a, like a decentralization of uh, content creators, a decentralization of individual reporters, and not like one big media house that has like a head on top of it that controls what's in the newspaper, or what's not, and more like okay, I can follow him, uh, I can follow Derek on on Twitter, I can follow uh, Robin on YouTube. Like, is is this like also like a kind of a decentralization uh, of of our world and brings more freedom? I I can see it in its in its infancy. Uh, and I, I say that with a little bit of caution, um, you know, like YouTube is a Google company very much in bed with the, with governments across the world, uh, especially for combating what they call misinformation, which is anything that goes against the propagandized narrative. Um, when you think of something like Twitter, uh, where the 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 owner has said that this is a free free speech platform it is better it is a better option than say youtube is um and of course this is you know the content format notwithstanding just trying to get your message out there it's better to an extent but at the same time i would not say that twitter is a free speech platform uh there are still people getting banned for saying things that aren't really that terrible um it's still better for people who are more liberty-minded to a to a, to a very large degree um but i think that it still has a long way to go because you know freedom of speech really means freedom of speech saying whatever you feel like saying um and i get the whole uh freedom of speech not freedom of reach thing and yeah, absolutely. As a as a capitalist myself, I understand that Elon has the authority to dictate what is allowed and isn't allowed on his website. I'm not saying that he doesn't. But I will say that saying that it's a free speech haven is a bit of a misnomer. Um, there are people that I've seen get banned for ultimately rather super, superfluous things. Um it's getting better. There, It has been a very long process, and I have seen some improvement along those lines. Uh, I still think that it has a long way to go. But with that, I will say that as far as social media generally is concerned, Twitter does have the most freedom for the content creator uh, among the mainstream social media platforms. Um, so I use Twitter very heavily. Um, I know that there are uh, some more decentralized and even like fully open source social medias like uh, I think Mastodon's one. I, I don't know. There's, there's a couple that are just kind of out there. But the thing is, they don't have a lot of users. So it's as a content creator, you can't really rely on those, even though they may be objectively better for, uh, you know, freedom of speech and saying what you want. Uh, it, whenever you go to a place like that, you're not going to get, you know, the engagement that you're otherwise wanting and needing as a content creator, especially if you're, if you're trying to make a career out of content creation, which I by no means am, but, um, you know, with content creation, you need engagement with engagement, you need people. And if, with, you know, that means that you're going to have to be on something that has the people. So, um, Twitter is the best option from all of the social media, mainstream social media networks, but uh, I still think that it has a ways to go. Uh, it has a long way to go, and I full heartedly agree with that. Uh, and it's it's for me fascinating. I feel like I, I am on uh, Instagram, YouTube, on Twitter, and I think 
Instagram is the worst place. I get really, really fast <laughs> something taken off. <laughs> I feel like even though my reach is not as as big on the as on the other platforms, which is also like I feel like when the reach is higher, the, you, you should get banned fast because people recognize it. Of, uh, but yeah, it's it's all of the sudden not so. Uh, YouTube, I'm more careful, especially with the shorts that I put out. Uh, I notice when there's some word in there that they don't like, like shit, uh, they will demonetize that shorts, uh, which I really don't care for because shorts are like, they, they don't get any money anyways. I mean, some money, I think the, the most, the, 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 the most successful shorts brought me five euros or something like that. So it's, uh, not really money data was like 50 cents or like something like that. So it's not really uh, a, a monetary game. It's more like a, a reach game. Um, but Twitter is kind of like, I was I was never concerned. Like it's also like a mental thing. Like when, you, when I'm going on YouTube, I'm trying to like uh, put something in a frame which does not offend <laughs> uh, YouTube. Just when I put like the thumbnail, the titles, the descriptions in packed because I, I will not cut anything out what the, I guess that, uh, but when I think about everything that I can outside of that, I try to do a good job that the video gets as, as far as it can go on the YouTube platform. Uh, but on Twitter, like I just put out stuff like, uh, this is like, like my, my mind is just way, way more free on Twitter, uh, which I did not like, I hadn't, I had no reason to do that because I was never anything like any band on, on YouTube. I had never a bad experience on YouTube uh, and I had never a bad experience on Twitter. So like this mental thing is maybe just like <laughs> a ghost in my head, uh, but also experience from other people. Uh, and then we have other platforms like Macedon, as you said, and Nostra is a big one, uh, which we, you can also directly send Bitcoin and stuff like that. It works. Uh, but as you said, it's not a mass thing. Like l not a lot of people use it. Uh, and uh, yes, the few really big guys there actually could make a living out of it, but they also have like a really big following somewhere else. Uh, and they need mass adoption in order to be really competi uh, competitive to Twitter. But what I think, and I hope maybe I'm just like a ho really hopeful person and a really uh, positive thinking person, I hope that those kind of innovations and also Twitter going in a more freedom direction, that this just triggers that if you're not a freedom loving platform in the future, that people will go away from them. That like the, the freedom platforms are those, those where the people are more and more. I feel like Twitter got a lot of reach in the last one year uh, because people came back and it got way more um, yeah, be, be, I feel like the, the conversations are more happening now on Twitter than before the, the platform got more life into it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's funny how it goes. And, uh, I feel like just as a content creator, I will do my best job possible to just like put the freedom word and the Bitcoin word out there. And if I get banned, I get banned. I have to live with that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, honestly, one thing that the folks at Twitter could do to really increase their support is fully open source their front end and back end uh, for the entire site, so people can audit it, you know, in the in the open source community and say, "Oh yeah, this is what the algorithms are," and "Oh, this is what leads to you getting shadow banned and things like that." I mean, they just started doing that, but not completely right. They, they yeah. have some type of algorithms is, is open source, but not everything, uh, which is a step. I feel like also, like I, this is a speculation on my side, but I feel like Elon Musk is trying to get in this direction, uh, but he does not want to get too fast there. <laughs> like he's, he's slowly, slowly get, getting there. And you can see the, the steps he's implementing because he's also seeing a platform that's working. And he does not want to break it too fast, so it's right. it's still it's still working uh, because they also are depending on advertisement money and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it's 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 funny how it, how it goes. But I, I love the scene where he said like, uh, "Fuck you to the creators, uh, yeah. I don't know, to the creators, to the to the advertisers, to Disney, and to yeah. Disney also." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, um, but on, on that note, do you see or do, do you witness a war uh, on privacy, especially like on privacy and on freedom uh, uh, right now? Like, do you see like yeah. the, the people like? Absolutely. Uh, Congress just, uh, you know, the U.S. Congress just passed that uh, is effectively a TikTok ban. Now, I don't use TikTok, um, but the fact that Congress uh, passed a bill that would effectively ban the use of um, a website is incredibly authoritarian. Uh, and, you know, the NSA has always been, had their, their, <laughs> You know their their focus on abolishing people's privacy, uh, especially in this digital day and age that we live in. Um, you know, and I don't think anything has gotten better on that uh, on that front in the you know now eleven years since uh, Ed Snowden you know revealed what they were doing. I think if anything has gotten worse, um, I you know especially with the implementation of AI, I can only imagine what the NSA is using AI for. Um, uh, you know, because that just makes that just streams line streamlines their, you know, information gathering. Um, it's it's evil. It, it really is, especially because um, they're they're using private companies uh, as as their essentially their scapegoats. Right. You know, they there's effectively requiring companies to have these terms of use to where they're collecting data for the purpose of giving to the government because the government is essentially holding them hostage and, you know, making them by tax incentives or, or whatever, you know, something that nobody in their right mind was going to, is going to turn down if it is voluntary. And I'm not even so sure that it is. Um, but you know, I, I, I've seen articles come out like opinion pieces saying that, Oh yeah, you don't need to use VPNs anymore. Uh, which kind of tells me that they're, wanting to target VPNs, uh, which is very, very concerning. Uh, I could see them launching a an attack on Tor. For those who don't know what Tor is, it's the dark web. Um, launching attacks on Tor, uh, launching attacks on, on even open source community items. Uh, I could see them spinning that as some crazy, you know, as some crazy propagandized way to where Oh yeah, open source is evil for one reason or another, and and they'll spin it in a way where the masses will will ultimately believe it. Um, and so that'll get rid of you know your aftermarket operating systems for your phone. It'll get rid of using Linux. Uh, you know for the most part, uh, I could I could see them going after well anything that's not based in the United States and essentially turning the United States internet into what the Chinese and North Koreans get, which is nothing. Um, and especially if they close all those bridges, um, you know, they're, they're, they're pushing hard on KYC for digital assets. Uh, you know, they just, um, well, I, I know you don't like, you know, keeping things, you know, with current events, but they just arrested, uh, Roger Ver, uh, on tax evasion, even though he's no longer a U.S. citizen. Um, it's, it is absolutely disgusting what they do, and I think that it's only going to get worse because, uh, honestly, because Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is a threat to them because people are waking up a little bit, and so they're going to use it to, um, they're going to use it as, as a weapon, you know, to to make sure that people get into compliance. Um, and I just see that. I just see a lot of bad things happening. I really do. Yeah, it's a massive threat to them. I mean, I just see like even in Austria and Germany, uh, I just recently talked with, like yesterday I talked with someone uh, who has in a small town in uh, in, in his, his town where he's living in Freiburg, uh, he's just going around and m trying to motivate every restaurant, every shop to accept Bitcoin. Uh, just to like have those options and they're really like passionate about it and they're like this is their their this option uh, and uh, as I'm like I only hold Bitcoin like I don't hold any fiat currencies I just use it uh, as a medium of exchange at this point because I'm forced to do it but if we are like fighting more and more for for Bitcoin and 
uh, more and more merchants ex just accept Bitcoin because they can. Uh, then, like, for, if if I could live, like, if if there would not be tax implications on Bitcoin, and I could actually spend it directly, I would not use fiat. This is like I'm yeah. only using fiat because I'm actually forced to do it. Uh, and uh, we're seeing countries where you're not forced to use it, as like El Salvador. Uh, and uh, there are even like in the Swiss, there's Lugano, where you can uh, pay your taxes or at least some taxes in, uh, in, in, in Bitcoin, where you can pay most of the shops with Bitcoin and stuff like that. Uh, I recently interviewed a company uh, which completely operates without a bank account in Swiss, which is amazing to me. Uh, yeah. So it's definitely a threat to it. Like it's 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 fascinating to see. Yeah, uh, I would I would also be curious as to see how some of these countries expand their uh, legal tender laws, uh, because right now they you know legal tender laws for the most part are saying you must accept you know Federal Reserve notes or euros in exchange for your debts. I could see them expanding that to say you can only accept Federal Reserve notes or euros for exchange of, of goods and, and as payment of le le uh, for legal tender. Uh, I could see that, and that would absolutely be devastating if they did that. Um, I I don't know what the reaction would be. Hopefully, it would be one where they would be forced to undo something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I could see the state doing that for sure. Uh, well, uh, absolutely. And I feel like the, the, the states are getting more and more authoritarian. How do you keep like sense <laughs> different uh, maybe a weird question for you, but how do you keep like your optimism up? Like how do you see like is 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 Bitcoin uh one of the things where like okay it's like a little bit of hope for, for the future is like how do you maintain uh, your hopefulness and optimism for the future? It is very hard. Um anybody I think I think anybody listening will understand that it, it is very hard. Um the world is not sunshines and rainbows. It it is very very evil, very um, very tyrannical, very oppressive. And the scary part is, is that your average person probably doesn't understand the extent to which, if they even understand that it is at all, um, because essentially the world has transformed uh, from nobles and peasants to elites and free range peasants who don't know that they are free range peasants. Um, you know, you, you, you'll see it with Americans all the time talking about how this is the land of the free. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, and then they'll say something stupid, like, well, go mo move to Somalia or something. It's like, okay, if you, you don't, you don't understand what tyranny is clearly because of the fact that, um, you know, there is no better, there is no good place on the planet to live. It's all awful. Um, and that's, that's the world as it is. Um, one thing I do is I, I, I do see, I, I try to help spread the message of Liberty a lot, you know, like I've done with my book and, you know, I post essays on Twitter, um, to try and help get, you know, wake people up and, so there's some optimism there. I'm not alone in my views, clearly. I mean, you're you're along the lines too. Um, and there are people waking up and, you know, with more and more people getting into crypto, I think that that is um, something that is positive as well. There are a few nuggets of optimism that can be viewed. Uh, and so I try and focus on those as much as I can, but I still know that the world is a shit place um, any place that the state exists is going to be a, a tyrannical shithole. Um, but, you know, I'm looking to, uh, I need to take care of me and my own. So that's where my focus is. I would love to change the world. And maybe one day one of my books or articles will, uh, or at least have a hand in that. I, I don't have any delusions of grandeur that that will ever happen, but, um, you know, if I can, if I can help change a few people in the world, uh, you know, that's, that's a few more than we had. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's, it's easy to be pessimistic. And so I am, I mainly focus on how I can improve the life, you know, my life and my family's life. Um, 
and how we can essentially live out our days in relative peace. So that's where my focus is. Do you see uh, El Salvador as, as one of the places? Because Bitcoin I like to talk about El Salvador, but yeah, they also have their their, their big flaws. But do, do you even observe El Salvador right now with Bitcoin and stuff like that? Yeah, I, um, I remember when El Salvador added Bitcoin to their legal tender laws. Um, and I thought that was amazing. Of course, time will tell you know, what the political climate in El Salvador turns into be, um, you know, uh, Argentina is another one that I kind of have an eye on, but there are some things that Malay has been doing that I'm not excited about. Uh, but you know, the, and then, you know, the, it might just be as simple as building a cabin in the woods and, <laughs> you know, uh, being as far away as I can be from the state, but um, you know, I'm, I'm open to anything, anywhere. I would love to retire in, uh, in a place where I don't have to, uh, where I can just be happy and my, my family's happy and healthy. And then ultimately that's all that matters. So, um, you know, I'm look I'm always looking at other countries, uh, if, if possible, if as a potential solution, um, but I'm not at retirement yet. So all of that could change, you know, over the next 20 years so yeah definitely um and i feel like when well you said like uh i said it in the previous podcast um last year was at bitcoin prague and it's a kind of a different bitcoin co uh, conference than the bitcoin conference in america it's like really focused more on privacy and freedom uh i feel like from the from the crowd also uh um it's just a subjective feeling that i have there and it's uh i I compared it to more like a freedom uh, conference and less than a Bitcoin conference. We talk a lot about privacy and a lot about freedom and, and stuff like that. I so I feel like I'm really looking forward to June uh, to, to this podcast, uh, to this uh, conference again, and because there will be a lot of uh, like-minded people in real life, not just in podcast form, not just on Twitter. <laughs> I'm always looking forward to, to that kind of uh, uh, conversations in real life. Um, before we end the, the podcast with our end routine, uh, what are you currently extremely passionate about? Is there anything that we did not cover uh, or about your passions that you're learning a lot or you're covering a lot in your life that we did not cover on the podcast till now? Um, I mean, I, I've just always been, been passionate about liberty generally, uh, which is kind of why I am the way that I am and why I advocate for what I advocate for. Um, but there is, uh, one thing that I am pursuing, uh, or at least will be actively pursuing over the next year. Uh, and that's to get my pilot's license, because I think that that will help open up, uh, more opportunities to, uh, to explore places of potential retirement. Um, you know, I, I have always had a, a passion for flying, even though I've never, I mean, I, the the last time that I that I flew a plane was in 2009. It was also the first time I flew a plane. Uh, but I'm, I'm I'm I've always wanted I've always been interested in aviation. I've always wanted to get my pilot's license, and I'm finally I'm finally going to start do it doing it. And um, I think that that could be a a really cool way to one help spread the message of liberty, but also to you know, expand my horizons beyond, uh, what, you know, where they currently are and have the freedom to travel without having the TSA molest me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I've, I've flown, uh, twice as much as you. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who is a pilot and I flew with him two times. Uh, and I had the honor to land, uh, the two times and flew in the air a little bit, even though I have no clue about flying, but he explained a little bit to me. So I'm not completely lost and he was always there, but it's a really nice feeling. Uh, I feel like I'm not in, in the life phase right now where I will do it because I'm just really building stuff. Uh, but, uh, if I had like the time, I would, I would love to do it. Like I, uh, let's, uh, I, I would love to do it. Um, for the end routine, we have uh, end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest, which is always a difficult part because I cannot, I will not, I can, I don't control that kind of a question, and the previous guest does not 
know who the next guest is so it can be a question where like the next guest does not uh know, know much about it uh, i will still ask it uh if, if you have uh if you have an opinion on that or if if, if you know about uh, that um when will the bitcoin meme pool a mempool uh, clear next if at all uh meme pool like mempool mempool it's it's not related to any meme <laughs> oh it's not related to me i don't know what a bitcoin mempool is uh so i'm gonna say tomorrow how about that <laughs> tomorrow is that a good thing or a bad thing i uh i i think the mempool will not clear like it, it's it's been what is a mempool like the mempool you can see all the transactions and every 10 uh, minutes we have the blocks and when right. it clears, there's no transaction in the block. Like this is this kind of this feeling. And I think it was last time happening over a year now. Uh, I think last April, maybe it was like last a year ago, April. Uh, so uh, it could never happen again. Like uh, I had, and I had last uh, podcast guest, uh, Vicked on, and Vicked is extremely deep into uh, like on a blockchain level of Bitcoin which right. I, I'm not, like I could not <laughs> in deep explain to you what a mempool actually is. Uh, I'm trying to educate myself more and more also with inviting guests like that because I took right. a lot of notes. Um, but it, it just like, it, it's interesting to see the, the free market dynamics on the Bitcoin blockchain with transaction fees and stuff like that. Uh, that's uh, also from a free market uh, dynamics point of view, I think is really interesting to see the, uh, the fee development of Bitcoin, where we have some fees of like really high, because you can set your own fee. Yeah? Like you can you can pay $1 million to transact one euro. Like you can do that if you want. <laughs> like they, <laughs> nobody's, nobody is, is holding you back from that, which is an interesting thought experiment. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, that's, that's the question. But yeah, it's obviously uh, uh, not, no, no good question, but I, I still wanted to give it to the next guest to keep the end routine going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, in that case, I would say that if it is going to happen again, I would say at the end of the bull market, the current bull cycle. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah. It's actually also been the longest time uh, that it's not has been cleared for so long. Like we're in <laughs> uncharted territory right now in the Bitcoin blockchain, if you will. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, but yeah, um, before I let you go, where can people like ask you questions about the book, uh, ask you a philosophical question, like where can people reach you in the best possible way? So you can find me on Instagram at Ancap Air. I am very inactive there. I don't post a lot. If anything, I'm just kind of scrolling. Uh, the main place you can find me is on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, at Ancap Air, at A-N-C-A-P-A-I-R. Uh, my DMs are open or you can at me, uh, by all means, uh, you know, my book, you can find it on Amazon, um, or audible. If you, if you'd rather have the, um, the audiobook version, uh, you'll get to hear my sexy voice narrated for you. So, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that does anything for you, but, uh, but yeah, it could be a selling point. So why not? Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly on Twitter. I'm working on my second book now. This one's going to be a novel. So I'm, I'm, uh, hopefully this writer's block ends quickly because I really am excited about the direction of this book, the, where this book is going, but I just need to figure out how to get there. Yeah, it's definitely a selling point. Like I'm an Audible fan. I, I'm unable to read books for some reason, uh, but I consume books on Audible really good, and I can also remember stuff more. And when I read read books, I like I don't know maybe I have some brain function, but I am getting bored so much, uh, and and then I drift off. Uh, and I'm a big Audible fan, and I always like when the author is speaking himself, especially when I know the author. Uh, mm -hmm. And when someone is listening to that and they're not curious about the book, it's it's definitely a selling point. I feel like that's that's a good thing to do. And I would not do it differently uh, with my book. I will always like have the narrations, even though it's, it could be a time consuming, but it's like a one-time thing you have to do. It's like you invest the time. It's definitely good and uh, good that yeah. you did it. Uh, then thank you for your time. Thank you for being on. It, it was a pleasure having you. And yeah, thank you. 
uh, for, for being on. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for the invite. This was a great conversation. I appreciate it.